Please stand for the call to worship. It has become too common for us, and so I don't think we quite fathom how amazing it is. The eternal God who made heaven and earth loves you, has called you by name, and by his spirit, he has now drawn you here this day to hear his word and to respond and worship. Shout joyfully to Yahweh all the earth and serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing, knowing that the Lord himself is God, and it is he who has made us, not we ourselves, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise, giving thanks to him and blessing his name. Because the Lord is good, his loving kindness is everlasting, and his faithfulness is to all generations. And so let us now together invoke our God. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to revere your name. Hear then God's greeting to you loved by God and called to be saints, the conquerors who overcome the world in darkness and shall inherit the crown of life, grace and peace in the election of the Father by the blood of the Son and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let us affirm our faith and declare to before all creation that we have come to worship the God revealed in the scriptures, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us profess the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made man. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son, and with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection from the dead and to life in the earth to come. Amen. Let us then sing Psalm 76, affirming that God powerfully reigns and is known. And keep in mind that this is not going to take away all of your troubles and doubts because Psalm 77, the second lowest point of the Psalms, appears right afterwards, but it does help you to keep perspective. And so we declare God is known, and therefore we are worshiping the God who's revealed himself. So let us sing Psalm 76, God the Lord is known in Judah.
seated. And so Psalm 76 affirms not only the Lord's rule, but you'll notice also in contrast the defeat of the kings of this world, which is important for us because we tend to feel the oppression and the pressure of the kings, the rulers of this world, and so we are prone to ignore the law of God, and we are uh, very tempted quite often to even deny that we are Christians in order that we would just simply be left alone. But understand, God rules over all. He will destroy his enemies, and we want to be counted as his friends and as his beloved children whom he will preserve and deliver to everlasting life. Let us turn then to the law of God and therein learn and understand the way in which we are to see God, how we are to evaluate ourselves, and where we shall find peace. Together then, God's law displays his holiness and perfection. It is given as my only sure guide to knowing his will and pleasing him. But as a fallen man, I cannot obey the law. I turn to the law to see my sinfulness, that I may be humbled and confess my sins before God, because he declares, as I live, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man turn from his way and live. I will not be justified by the works of the law." Keep those last two lines in mind. You're not trying to get a law that will justify you. What you are, however, hoping for is to understand where your sins are and then to turn from your wicked way and find in Christ Jesus life from the dead. I am Yahweh your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So beloved, what does the 10th commandment require? That not even the least inclination or any thought against any commandment of God ever enter our heart, but that with our whole heart, we continually hate all sin and take pleasure in all righteousness. Very specifically, this law speaks of coveting, which would be envy. Uh, We've covered this under you shall not steal that, that leads to that. But we saw the Lord Jesus also took this very idea of sin beginning in the heart when he said, great, you haven't committed outward adultery, but if you lust for a woman in your heart, you're already guilty. Or if you hate your brother in your heart, you've already committed murder. And so the summary teaching that we have here in the Catechism tells us to consider that God is not simply impressed in what man sees, our outward behavior, but that God is interested that our desire be for that which is right and good according to his revelation. And you see that in that last line there, that we with our whole heart are always hating anything that is sinful or leading to sin and taking pleasure in all those things which reflect God, righteousness. And therefore, we are learning to be content, not coveting, not envying, not hating, not lusting, because we believe God is a good God and Father to us. That He has given us what is necessary at this moment. And while it might not suit our immediate taste, that is not the standard of the world, but rather God and his love and wisdom is to be trusted. And so basically, if you've ever committed any sin, and we all have, we've also violated the 10th commandment along with it because we have not trusted God to be a good and loving God. So let's confess our sins and Let us remind ourselves of what is the gospel so that we will not be depressed when we leave here thinking, oh, I failed, I'm in trouble. But we'll understand, I failed, but God is gracious through Christ. Together then, God has sent his son Jesus in the likeness of my sinful flesh as an offering for my sin. In doing this, God demonstrates his electing love for me in that Christ died for me, the sinner, that no one is justified by the law before God is clear, for the man who by faith is righteous shall live. I don't have a righteousness that is my own from my obedience to the law, that, w- that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. I believe that I am justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, apart from my own works and attempts to follow the law. This idea of faith is very, very important for the right understanding of our redemption. So from the catechism, what is true faith? True faith is not only a sure knowledge 
whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also a hearty trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel, that not only to others, but to me also, forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation are freely given by God, merely of grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. A true faith then believes the revealed word of God, the promises, and doesn't seek to go before God and impress him, but simply accepts the gift that is given to us through Jesus Christ and knows this, while to the world seems ridiculous, we know it is true, it is sufficient. So beloved, let us go before God, not only confessing our sins, but let us express we do believe his promises and we are thankful for Christ our Redeemer. O most holy God, you have commanded us to know you, to understand you, to hear your word of revelation through the prophets and apostles, and to acknowledge all that you say is good. And when we do so, we condemn ourselves, because when we declare your law is good, we reveal ourselves to be God-haters, who have never trusted that you are the overflowing fountain of good. We have acted as your enemies, and we have believed you to be our enemy. We have accounted you as a failed God who has not given us what we should have and has given too much to our enemies. And now this day we are forced to confront this reality. We are the sinful creatures who have taken every advantage of every good thing and despise the giver of these gifts. No matter what we've had, it has not been enough. No matter what you give to others, we demand it be given to us. We have been envious, we have been covetous, we have been hate-filled, we have been lust-filled. We have despised your truth and holiness. And this condemnation is right and just. But instead of giving to us the, the death we deserve, you announce to us this day, I will not take pleasure in your deaths. I call upon you to repent, turn to me, and live. Find in me grace. Trust in Jesus' merit alone. Lord, we don't. It's too difficult to believe. We would never be gracious like this, and so we find it unbelievable that you are gracious. So we ask this day, work in us a firm conviction of your gospel promises. Help us to see you are not like us, but that you are very good. And we have been complete fools in never believing you and in hating you. Lord, lead us in the way of righteousness and help us to understand how gracious you are that we will no longer be envious and covetous, will no longer be filled with hate and with lust because we will believe you are good. You are giving us good things. You are always doing rightly. And the life we have today is the life we should have. It is the right one for us. It is where we serve you. It is where we glorify your name. It is where we are being prepared for eternity in your presence. Sanctify us by the word of truth, by the power of the Spirit. Unite us to Christ our head and give to us that we should love the thoughts, words, and deeds of Jesus Christ and that to which we have been ordained. And may we praise and glorify you, the eternal God and King and our loving Father. Amen. Beloved, please stand that you may again hear, that you may have reinforced in you the word of the gospel this day. Hear then the absolution. To you who by faith have confessed and repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus' merit alone, I declare in the name of Christ and by the authority of his word, your sins are forgiven. The record of your transgressions is blotted away, and your everlasting salvation is hid now in Christ Jesus, who will resurrect you in the last day. And so, beloved, let us affirm it's a wondrous thing to know that God and sinners are reconciled by Christ our Lord, the only begotten Son of God. We will sing then, Hark the Herald Angel Sings, a song of response to the gospel this day. Oh. 
Please be seated. What a wondrous thing to know that the eternal God would lay aside all his prerogatives for glory in order to redeem us. Have confidence that God's love for you is so great. Let us now go before, go, go before God in prayer. And you see that on page 16, the things we pray for, for our local church, for the world, for ourselves. And keep in mind, this is not just something that we go through blindly. Remember, Jesus said he hates it when people just pile on words and just kind of go through routines in prayer. He wants us to converse with him as the personal God and Savior. And so let us take our concerns to him with sincerity of heart, desiring that we be heard and that we would be blessed and continue to hear from him. Let's pray. Our great and most holy God, we are thankful that this day, you, again, have been merciful and gracious to us. Help us to understand and to believe that really and truly, you do not delight in the destruction of the wicked, but rather that the wicked man would turn and live. And this day, you are ministering to us the gospel that we would turn away from our wickedness, that we would repent and we would trust in Christ Jesus and there find life. And Lord, as a people who have now been delivered from death to life, Help us to understand what this means. We are part of that new living temple with Christ the cornerstone. We who had once been stones in the temple of idols are now made purified to be stones in the living temple of Christ Jesus where God the Father is glorified. And here we have the privilege of giving our service, of being used by you in order that many, many more would be saved. It is difficult for us to believe that we, sinful vessels of clay, would be instrumental in your hands for the redemption of many, and yet we are. Let us rejoice in this. Let it be our great joy that we are prophets and priests of God in Christ, able to declare the excellencies of your grace because we have experienced it and we believe it and we desire to see others receive this gift. And so may this church be an evangelistic church, a witnessing church. May every one of us seek more opportunity and pray for the courage that we would speak boldly in love and call people out of darkness and bring them to the kingdom of light and life. So we pray for the mission of our local congregation, of each member of this church. We pray for the mission of our federation of all faithful confessional churches, and especially for the mission around the world in lands where the scriptures are not available, where churches are actively persecuted, where people have grown up in completely different religions and are unaware that you alone are God. Lord, we pray this day for the nation of Uzbekistan and the Uzbek people spread throughout the lands. We pray, Lord, that all the Turkic and Mongol peoples would hear the gospel 
that they would give up their shamanism and animism and Islam and would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that you are capable of much more than we could ask for or imagine. We know it is a wondrous thing to know that 12 frightened men were used in order to be the foundation of a church that is now worldwide. And so we know what we are asking is not too much for you. May the gospel go forth in Central Asia among the Turkic and Muslim peoples. And may they who have persecuted and hated Christians turn to you and live. And may the Christians in these lands remain faithful to you through whatever trials are ordained, that they may be a light to the nations and bring the hope of life to those who are perishing. Lord, we pray this day for Vanuatu, thankful to hear that the gospel is preached and people believe and that the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ is alive and well in that land. We pray also at this time for Venezuela. And we know this is a land very troubled where the people gave up any semblance of the gospel, embraced materialism, and now their idols have brought them to destruction. We are thankful the gospel is in this land, but we are troubled that very few people hear it. So we pray that the word of the gospel will go forth powerfully in this land and those who are living hopelessly would find in Jesus Christ not only hope for this day, but for the age to come. Lord, we also pray for Vietnam. And we ask that the people would not confuse Christ's church with Western uh, imperialism of the past, but rather they would see and know that the church of Jesus Christ is a kingdom that gives hope and life to all. And so we are thankful that even through all the wars and troubles of that land, the church has remained. Now we pray for the church to be even more vibrant and fruitful and bring to a land that is perishing the hope of life and that the peoples would find in Jesus Christ all that they need, all that they cannot find in this world. We pray for ourselves and our own families and for our call to be a witness to those around us. It is difficult. People know our weakness, our hypocrisy, and so it is difficult for us sometimes to face people and tell them to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we pray, O oh Lord, not only that we would be confident of your forgiving love, but that it would be also able to come out of our mouths in a clear, articulate way that our hearers would know and believe you are a gracious God who saves sinners. So we pray for the people in our own households, wives and husbands, parents and children, brothers and sisters. Lord, we pray that no one would perish, but rather all would hear and believe and find life in you. We ask, O oh Lord, for our failings not to block others. Forgive us our sins and forgive that we have been a stumbling block to others. Help us to take seriously the warning it would be better if we were thrown into the sea than cause the little one to stumble. May we therefore desire that truth would always go forth and that many would be blessed. Lastly, this day we ask that you care for our members who are not here this day. There are some who are unable to attend. They are dangerous for their lives and so they cannot come. Lord, be with them and continue to encourage them. There are others who have chosen not to come, seeing it as an inconvenience. Lord, strengthen their faith and help them to understand how we are called to be gathered together and that this is not an optional activity, but that it is vital, it is life-giving for us to be under the means of grace. We pray for those who are being torn up, whether by illness or by depression. And we pray for sisters and brothers who need every bit of encouragement that only you can give by your word. Use us, O oh Lord, as instruments in your hand to be a blessing to those who are weak and to be able to bring the light to those who are in darkness. And in all this, may you receive all the glory and praise. Now we come to you praying to you as God our Father, as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Please stand now for the reading of the written word of the Lord. Let us hear then the written word from the Old Testament. This is Exodus chapter 1 verse 15 through 212. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Pua, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birthstool, if it is a son, you shall kill him, but if it is a daughter, she shall live. 
But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives. And the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every son that is born to the Hebrews you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took him, she took for him a basket, correct, ark, made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the riverbank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of her pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse this child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. So in the New Testament, Matthew 2, 1 through 18. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by the night and departed to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Out of Egypt I called my son. Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious and sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. So far the written word. Our Lord God, we pray for humble hearts that we would hear this word, that we would know and understand how much we have been on the serpent's side, how much we have despised the Lord of glory, and how we have been involved with those who have sought to destroy the kingdom of Christ. Help us to see and know that it was your will to save many out of this dark kingdom, and we are recipients of grace. Help us to understand how wondrous is your love and how powerful is your work of providence that you brought about our redemption. May we see and know that you are a gracious and loving God. Amen. Please be seated. 
It is important for us to always have our eye on Jesus. It is necessary that we not become overly enamored with academic theology and lose sight of the fact that we are here to worship the person, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to know who he is and what he has done. Because there's always a danger when studying the word, which is necessary to do, to get too deep into theology. Now, that's not a bad thing. To go deeper and deeper into theology is right and good to do. The problem is, if we do it at the expense of remembering, we are actually here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the additional theological knowledge is meant to make our worship more full, rather than to be a substitute for worshiping Jesus Christ. So it's good once in a while to go back and to just again consider Jesus was really a man. He was the eternal God, but he really was humiliated. He gave up all his glory in order that he would be born of a woman, in order that he would have the flesh we had, in order he would live the life in this world facing all the sorrows and temptations and troubles, remaining faithful in our place, that we would obtain that righteousness and that he would die the sinner's death so that we would be spared that death and we would live. And so... It's good for us to remember who is Jesus. Now, it's also necessary for us to see how all the Old Testament typology helps us to understand more fully the work of Jesus and what he would undergo. Now, it's one thing for you and me to begin a new venture. We begin optimistically. Yeah, we might be able to get some good advice from those who've gone before and learn about all the pitfalls and we'll take precautions and Let's be honest about it. It's pretty rare that we enter something knowing there's going to be a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, but we're going to get through this. Rather, we always go in more hopeful. Yes, I know others have suffered, but maybe I'll be the exception. Maybe things will go well for me. Maybe my work will be productive, and from beginning to end, no mistakes will be made, no bad decisions, no setbacks. All will work out. What well, was not so for Jesus? Jesus is eternal God. He had ordained that the work he would do would come at an incredibly high cost to himself. And it would be the worst possible thing. The eternal God, who had always had perfect fellowship between the Father, Son, and Spirit, would have to forsake the Son, would have to abandon him as the worst enemy so that he would die. And this would all be at the conclusion of 30 plus long years of living in a world where nobody saw and understood God rightly, where no one offered sacrifices without hypocrisy and lies, where the priests were corrupted, where the Jews were corrupted, and where all around the land were pagan temples everywhere the Lord Jesus went. Even his own family was sin-filled. Even his own siblings did not believe anything that he told them, and they mocked him for it. Jesus basically had to give up all good things. The right recognition of who he was with the angels worshiping and adoring him and come into a world and be surrounded by the worst of the worst sinners and blasphemers of every sort, and then to live through all this faithful to God his Father, and in the end, go and die at the hands of these very same idolaters and blasphemers, and do so for their good, always asking God, don't count their sins, don't hold it against them, but redeem them. He also had to know, and did know, that there would be cost to those around him. The grief his mother would suffer, the failures and the sorrow his own disciples would feel at abandoning him, but even from the day of his birth, that other children would die at the hands of the seed of the serpent. And that's what we're going to look at today, the costliness of Christ's coming. So in Exodus, we read the story of a new pharaoh that rises up, who believes himself to be very clever. He is a Psalm 2 king. He conspires against the Lord and his anointed, and he believes himself to be brilliant, and he is dealing shrewdly, cleverly, he thinks. And so he's evaluating and seeing that there's this group living in my country, but they are not my countrymen. We are Egyptians. We have an ancient heritage. We are 
uh, we've been here for thousands of years. In fact, in the Egyptian mindset, the gods who created the earth made Egypt as the nation that would rule over others and would be the type that all of us would have to turn to to know what is right and good. In fact, the Egyptian pharaoh was a demigod. He was descended from the gods and would ascend to be a full god himself. And so this group that was living in Goshen and was growing in number was kind of a problem to him. So in his so-called divine wisdom, he came up with a solution. I'll just reduce their numbers by essentially killing off their boys and then we will take their girls to be our wives and then they'll be assimilated and we'll get all the benefits of the labor of the men who live, but we won't have to deal with their children. And so he commands these uh, midwives to kill these sons. So in other words, when you're there and the woman gives birth before she has a chance to see it, like it's gonna do something, strangle the baby, whatever it is. And yes, it is really that grotesque. She's, he's saying, kill their little boys and tell the mothers, oh, I'm so sorry, it just didn't work out. And this was the day in which half the babies born would die before the first year anyway. So it was not unexpected. But God put fear in these midwives' hearts where they recognize, boy or girl, these are image bearers of God and they are not to be killed. And so as the population of baby boys kept growing, Pharaoh became furious and demanded, why is this? And Quite frankly, they probably lied and said, oh, well, you know, we, we never even get to them before these babies are born. So we don't have a chance to, you know, subtly kill them off, whatever it was you were trying to do. So the king becomes even more furious and decides, fine, let me just make it the law of Egypt. You guys see a Hebrew baby, just throw him into the Nile. Let our God, the Nile, drown this potential enemy and let's be rid of the problem. And I'm sure many such boys were killed. Because when we read the story of Moses' birth, his mother is afraid and hides him, which means she has probably seen a number of babies already drowned and bodies floating in the river. But she loves this child and she hides this child as long as she can. But of course, the child gets fussy and gets louder and eventually it's going to be exposed. She's not sure what to do. And so in verse 3 of chapter 2, we're told she made him and, or she took for him an ark. It take, it's the exact same word as with Noah. Something was given by God to preserve life. And this ark was prepared to float in the river. So rather than the dead baby floating in the river, you have a child protected. But what's going to happen? Because, okay, she can't protect the child anymore. She has to let the child go. Will an Egyptian find him and drown him? So as the baby is floated on down, his older sister Miriam is observing. And at that time, Pharaoh's daughter, the man who'd given the order to murder all these babies, comes to bathe, she and her servants, and they see this basket. And Pharaoh's daughter opens it up and sees a crying baby. As opposed to her father, she had a bit of a conscience. She took pity on him. And at that time, Miriam shows up and says, hey, I noticed you have a baby there, but you weren't pregnant, so you're not going to be able to nurse him. So do you want me to find a wet nurse? Do you want me to find someone to nurse this child? She says, yeah, go ahead. Miriam goes back to mom, tells mom, hey, we've got a really great deal here because not only are you going to get my brother back, but you're going to get paid by Pharaoh's daughter to care for him. And so Moses is brought back to his own mother and she nurses him, gets paid for it, and finally this little slave boy is sent to the house of the king to become a king. He is named Moses. Now what's interesting about this story is that you see the wickedness of man. Pharaoh is basically following in the footsteps of his master, the serpent of Genesis 3. He wants to destroy the seed of the woman that was promised. So he has put out an order for all Israelite boys, all Hebrew boys to be drowned in the Nile at birth. And yet here, God is sovereign. God turns his daughter's heart to show mercy. And because of this, the line is preserved. The Jews are going to be rescued by a slave who becomes a king. And in this, what's so fascinating is it's all women that save his life. It's his mother who saw his beauty and loved him and hid him. 
It's then his sister who goes and stalks and makes sure that nothing happens to this ark so it doesn't overturn. And then it's Pharaoh's daughter who says, I will have pity and spare him. And then the mother's brought back in again to nurse and care for him. All this while the kings of the earth take counsel against the Lord and his anointed. Well, when Jesus is born, he now fulfills, he brings to completion what Moses was doing in his work as a shadow. He will be born and the king of that age will again be a son of the serpent, a seed of the serpent. He will do his father the devil's will. He will seek to destroy, in this case, the final and the complete, the right seed of the woman. And he will fail just as badly. When Jesus is born, a star appears in heaven so that those, the astrologers, these are the wicked idolaters who study the stars thinking that God speaks through the stars rather than through his prophets and apostles. And God did, in fact, reveal something to them. Yes, the pagans can be revealed, can be shown truth by God. Their methods are failures, but God can nonetheless do what he wishes. And they discovered that there is a natal star, as we call it, that one born king of the Jews is now upon the earth. And when they come to Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews, Herod is greatly distressed. And you would think that the remainder of the Jews, the high priests, the priestly family, the Levites, the scribes, the Pharisees, well, okay, Herod's troubled, but who cares? Herod is a Samaritan. He is, oh, or not Samaritan, he's like half Idumean, so he's half uh, Edomite, he is half Jewish. He's not really a Jewish king. He doesn't actually care about the Jews. Of course, he's troubled if there's a real king of the Jews. The rest of the Jews should be excited by it, but no. They have taken counsel with the wicked. They are also just as troubled. And when he, a guy who's obviously deeply hurt by the thought that there's another born king of the Jews, wants to know, well, where would this king of the Jews, the son of David, the Messiah, be born? They actually help him. Now, they're not stupid. Herod was not known for being gracious in any way. There's uh, writings in some of the uh, Latins that speak of it's better to be a dog in Herod's house than to be a son because if he ever thought you were a threat, he would kill you. So all the leaders of Jerusalem are assembling together, priests and the scribes, and are giving to Herod the location where he can find and murder the one born king of the Jews. The Gentiles have come to worship. The Jews have decided to kill him. Herod summons the wise men, asks them what time the star appeared, and says, you know, let me know so I can go and worship him. Well, the magi go, and they really do worship him. And they are given in a dream to know that they should not return to Jerusalem. So after worshiping him and giving him gifts, they turned and departed to their own country by another way. And then God comes and he gives a dream to Joseph. And he says, Joseph, take the child and go to Egypt. This is to fulfill the prophecy out of Egypt. I've called my son and there he would hide. And then verse 16, when Herod saw he had been tricked, dealt shrewdly with, he became furious and he sent and killed all the male children, all the baby boys in Bethlehem and that region who were two years old and under, according to the time ascertained by the wise men to fulfill the prophecy that was given. A voice was heard in Ramah weeping in loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. So what's happening here? Well, what we are seeing is what it means to be associated with the world. All those times that we thought that we were really, you know, I'm a Christian. I just don't need to be fanatic about it. Yes, of course, I should do a little bit more. But, you know, there's other things to do where, where we have allowed the world to guide us. It is this spirit, the spirit in Pharaoh and the spirit in Herod that would also then be in us. Because we also are really not interested in the one born king of the Jews. We have no natural inclination to be in complete submission to the God of God and the Lord of Lords who will have mercy on our enemies. Now, man will fanatically devote himself to a king who promises riches, who promises to kill the others, but one who says, I will die for your enemies and mine. And 
this is good news to you because you've been my enemy. We're too arrogant to believe that. We know it'll go well with us. What we don't want is for it to go well with our enemies. And so we will side with Pharaoh and with Herod, and we will hate the one who has been sent king of the Jews. We will hate the one who is given to rescue us. We will rather be shrewd. We will be wise in our own eyes. And that simple pity that Pharaoh's daughter had for the crying baby, that's too much even for us. It is a remarkable thing when God comes to us and says, I will save you. I will give to you a one, a child born in Bethlehem, whom the world will despise, seek to murder, and yet whom I will preserve because I intend to save. How do we know it's true? Well, the Jews could wait and hope because they knew God was faithful to fulfill his promises. He had promised to Abraham a child, and Abraham received a child when he was 100 years old, when his wife was a barren and dried tree, as she called herself. And then when further, the patriarch's wives were unable to bear children, God waited so that it would be his power where he would demonstrate he alone decides life and death, and he chooses to give life to many. And so barren woman after barren woman in the line of Christ produced a child, another heir. And now, years later, when God has said, I will rescue my people, the people didn't want the kind of rescue Jesus wanted to give them. They were not interested in Moses coming and saying, let us go and worship God purely. Because remember, when they leave Egypt, they don't leave as faithful Jews. They don't leave as lovers of Yahweh, God, who has rescued them. Because what's the first thing they do when they are not under direct supervision of Moses? They make idols, just like they had in Egypt. They have adopted the Egyptian practices of worship, and they regret the fact that they are God's people because for a little while, before they get to the land flowing with milk and honey, they have to deal with a little bit of desert sand. And so they say, we would rather go back and be under these very kings, under the very dynasty that threw our sons, our brothers, into the Nile to drown, that sacrificed Jewish babies to the Egyptian god of the Nile. Are you and I so different? I don't think so. In fact, we know with Christ's crucifixion, all the people were chanting, crucify him. If we had been there, we would have been caught up in the same nonsense. So why is God merciful to us? Because he cannot lie. He cannot break his own word. And he has desired, willed, to have for his son a kingdom. A kingdom of those whose entire life is based on Christ's righteousness. Therefore, we have to admit there is no good in us. We did not love him. We joined forces. We would join even more with the enemies of God. And yet, he makes us his friends. He purchases us by his own blood. And so we need to see this costliness of the sacrifice. And we need to be much, much less impressed with the things of this world. After all, Pharaoh was able to give a command. People great, you know, gladly wanted to impress Pharaoh. There was probably people that were competing to see who got to kill more Jewish baby boys. And when Herod gave the order, go and kill these babies in Bethlehem. I don't think there was a shortage of soldiers willing to obey. And yet, the ones who are despised in this world, a Jewish woman, her daughter, Pharaoh's daughter, whose name we don't even know, these are the ones who preserved Moses. They are the ones that God used in order to preserve the Redeemer of the Jews from Egypt. And for us, it is the Christ who has been preserved, not according to the will of the kings of this earth, but by God taking a scared, poor Jewish man, grabbing his wife and fleeing to Egypt. There, in that very inauspicious, very shameful-looking act, fleeing and living as a refugee, 
the hope of man was preserved. So, as we come to this time, as we seek to understand what should we do with all these things, well, the first thing is don't be the types of Christians that only are impressed with the church when the church is in power. The ones who will basically go to whatever is the richest and most powerful church. And while the church was big, you know, going back to the 40s, 50s, and 60s, where, you know, everybody kind of went to church, everybody went then because, not because they believed, but because that's what dignified, decent people did. But now, we're on the outs. The church is decreasing, not in numbers only, but in prestige. People hate what we are saying. People despise the fact that we point them back to Christ as the only hope, and not politics, not politicians, but the eternal kingdom and Christ. We're, we're going to get smaller. The church is going to get weaker. That seems to be the pattern. And yet, that's where life is found, not just for us, but life even for our family and our enemies. And so we need to start loving Jesus. We need to follow the pattern of those who would sacrifice all, even if the world hated them. They didn't care. They knew they were called to a particular service. Before Moses would be the great leader who would bring the Israelites out of Egypt, he was the little baby who was completely dependent on the love of his mother. And before Jesus would go to the cross and then rise from the grave and reign as the eternal king, he was a baby whom a poor Jewish man and woman had to grab in the middle of the night, flee to Egypt so that he would not die by the sword. And beloved, you and I now, we are able, very unglorified, low of little esteem in the world, yet we are the chosen and beloved of the Lord. And the thing to do then is to learn to love him for his grace to us in Christ. Let's pray. Our God, we ask that you should, by your Spirit, help us to see and understand our natural inclination to side with the kings of this world, with the plans of Satan, that serpent of old, to despise your beloved Son and to despise those whom he has purchased. Help us to understand that it is only by your Spirit, by your strength, that we should actually see and understand these things, but even more. It is only by the work of, the re of regeneration in our hearts that we will have a second birth and that we will be united to Christ our head. Let us therefore now delight that you did not find the manger to be too shameful. You did not mind becoming an infant, having lost all your glory and dignity and honor in order to purchase us. Help us to love you all the more for how great was your sacrifice for our deliverance. And may we now die to self, pick up our cross, follow you in the service we are commanded to perform, now and forever. Amen. And so it is good for us to remember that our hope of life and redemption is to be found in the promises of God fulfilled at just the right time. Let us stand and sing then, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Thank you.
Please be seated. When Jesus gave up his glory, it was for a time, and then he would be restored to his station, the right place for him to be at the right hand of God the Father. And yet he would always have us to remember his suffering. So as opposed to us, when we are kind of go through a shameful time, we want to forget it. We hope everyone else does also, and then remember the glory that we have. Jesus says, even when I am in glory, I want you to remember my shame and humiliation because that showed my love for you. That is how I purchased you. I want you to never forget how loved, how cherished you are, that I would give up all my majesty in order that you would not die in your sins. And so the Lord's table reminds us of that. The Lord's table testifies of the love of God to us, and it is a sealing sign confirming to us, yes, your faith is in the right place. This is a testimony that surely your sins are forgiven you and you have life from the dead. So as we come to the table of the Lord, it's not our telling the world, I'm gonna to try to be a better Christian. It's God telling you, despite the fact that you failed at everything, I am giving you the blood of my son to wash away your sins, and here's his body to nourish and strengthen you that you may grow in your sanctification. We read in the scriptures that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. For all who live in rebellion against God and in unbelief, this holy food and drink will bring you only further condemnation. If you do not yet confess Jesus Christ and seek to love under his gracious reign, we ask you to abstain. Nevertheless, for those of you who have confessed your sins and affirmed your faith in Christ, the promise is sure. Whoever eats my body and drinks my blood has eternal life and will not come into condemnation. You are invited to this sacred meal not because you are worthy in yourself, but because you are clothed in Christ's perfect righteousness. Do not allow the weakness of your faith or your failures in the Christian life to keep you from this table, for it's given to us because of our weakness and because of our failures in order to increase our faith by the feeding us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As the word is, has promised us God's favor, so also our Heavenly Father has added this confirmation of his unchangeable promise. So come, believing sinners, for the table is ready. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Almighty and everlasting God, who, by the blood of your only begotten Son, has secured for us a new and living way into the Holy of Holies, cleanse our minds and hearts by your word and spirit that we, your redeemed people, drawing close to you through these holy mysteries, may enjoy fellowship with the Holy Trinity through the body and blood of Christ our Savior. Our ascended Savior does not live in temples made by hands, but is in heaven where he continues to intercede on our behalf. Through this mystery, by your own word and spirit, these common elements are now set apart from ordinary use. While remaining bread and wine, these sacred elements nevertheless become so united to the reality they signify that we do not doubt but joyfully believe that we receive in this meal nothing less than the crucified body and shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us now go to our heavenly table and receive the gift of God for our souls. Amen. That we may be nourished with Christ, the true bread from heaven, let us lift up our hearts to Christ Jesus, our advocate at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us firmly believe all his promises, not doubting that we shall be nourished and refreshed with his body and blood through the working of the Holy Spirit as surely as we receive the bread and wine in remembrance of him. So, beloved, Lift up your spirits and hearts on high. Beloved, let us now come and receive the sacraments, the elements. Please take the elements with you and return to your seats, and then we shall partake of these things together. The elders will dismiss you from the back. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, 
to proclaim liberty to captives, freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. So they will be called the oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Surely he bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. We thought of him as stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. By his scourging, we are healed. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. My flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. In the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread in the sight of his disciples, breaking it and telling them, This is my body. It is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So, beloved, Take, eat, remember, and believe Christ's body broken for you. Jesus also took the cup and declared, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. So take, drink, remember, and believe Christ's blood shed for you to wash you and purify you that you may dwell in the house of God forever. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge the great mystery of this holy feast. Although we are unworthy to share this meal with you, it is by your invitation and dressed in Christ's righteousness that we've come boldly into the Holy of Holies. Instead of wrath, we received your pardon. In the place of fear, we have been given hope. Our high priest and mediator of the new covenant has reconciled us to you and even now intercedes for us at your right hand. So please strengthen us by these gifts so that relying only on your promise to save sinners who call on your name, we may by your spirit honor you with our souls and bodies to the honor and glory of your holy name. Amen. We would ordinarily collect our offerings now as our material token of our participation in the ministry of Christ, but never let it be that the offering is what you do and kind of like think of it as the end. Rather, it's the final stage. It begins with your heartfelt desire for the glory of God in all the world and your prayer for those who are lost, starting in your own family and extending to the world, and then your desire to be a witness, to evangelize, to bring the word of the gospel to others. And lastly, for those places that you know there are others where they're planting churches, sending missionaries, your material offering is kind of like the last step of that. And then also wanting to help your brothers and sisters. So never let it be that the offering becomes a substitute for your life of prayer and witnessing, but rather let it be just the material conclusion of those things. Let us sing praise to our God, recognizing his sovereign rule over all creation and the need for the wicked to no longer stay in their wicked condition before him. And this says, well, let sinners flee, but rather at this time, while it's still today, let sinners repent and find life in Jesus Christ. Let us stand and sing our, our concluding song of praise, Psalm 104. And beloved, though we live in a world where the kings of this world conspire against the Lord and his anointed and his kingdom and his body on earth, be assured 
The Lord is with you. He will grant to you not only that you will persevere, but that you will overcome. And so with the benediction, you are being told of the continuing ministry of Christ in you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. My grace is sufficient for you. Surely goodness and covenantal mercies will pursue you all the days of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord your God forevermore. Amen.